Hi there, welcome back to IndyCar on the 2nd of February. Now, you could be forgiven for thinking that nothing is happening with regards to independence in Scotland and that nobody is actually marching or protesting about anything at all in Scotland. Well, that is, if you watch mainstream media or read the UK's national newspapers masquerading as Scottish titles. Now, of course, the media blackout on independence is a very deliberate policy by the United Kingdom. And because it controls, as we mentioned yesterday in the programme, all of the United Kingdom media in Scotland is tightly controlled by Westminster, um, there's no chance that we are ever going to see any news at all about any kind of protests or marches or anything at all to do with independence. It's all been effectively blacked out. The only thing I could find if when I actually Google searched for torchlit processions the other night was Uphelia in, <laughs> in Shetland. Uh, obviously, Uphelia is regarded by the BBC's news editors as a kind of harmless bonfire night style uh, celebration by the Shetlanders. And so, therefore, it doesn't have any kind of political connotations which might damage the cause of the United Kingdom's domination of Scotland. So, again, we've seen the total news blackout. And, of course, there's nothing that any of of us can do about this because we are basically held in thrall by United Kingdom which controls the flow of news into Scotland and out of Scotland as well. So we're stuck really with this endless blackout and silence when it comes to any news at all about what people are doing to protest uh, in favour of independence or to march in favour of it or to do anything at all which disagrees with United Kingdom's stated aims of keeping the union together. So it's difficult to know really how you can proceed from here, but the United Kingdom is not happy with just blacking out news of independence. They also now are planning to attack our human rights and not just attack them, but actually abolish them all completely. Now you'll probably be aware that while we were members of the European Union as a part of the United Kingdom, our human rights were guaranteed under the, the European um, Human Rights Act. Now this is a piece of legislation which was adopted by the United Kingdom as a member of the EU and guaranteed everyone's human rights. Now, the United Kingdom government is planning to basically get rid of this and replace it with its own so-called Bill of Rights. Now, the contents of this bill are largely a bit of a secret, but I think we can be pretty sure that they're going to diminish things like the right to strike. The United Kingdom is already debating a bill which will tightly control uh, the use of strike action by all all the unions and of course this is something which is very much in the news at the moment where just about every single part of the public sector in the United Kingdom is striking at the moment and this is something which back in the 1970s um, destroyed three different governments in the United Kingdom who could not control the working people of the UK and their demands for higher wages in the face of escalating inflation. So very similar circumstances to today. And we also know today that the Bank of England is planning to raise the bank interest lending rate again by a half percent, raising it I think to four percent from 3.5. And this is going to cause mayhem in the property market because many people who bought their homes during the period when Interest rates were effectively zero from about 2009 all the way up until well past 2015, mostly due to the banking crash in 2008, where uh, basically in order to lend any money to anybody, they had to cut their own base rates. But now that is over and the uh, Bank of England is using this blunt instrument to bludgeon us all down the way to try to damp down people's demands, first of all, for wages and to try to force inflation down. Now, some inflation is necessary in any economy uh, because without any inflation, there can't be any growth because in order to increase profits, prices go up. We know this from looking at the profits of the oil companies. And we also know that I think BP announced today that it made the biggest profit in its entire history. That's over well over 115 years, I think, that BP has been going biggest profits it's ever made. And yet there is still no sign of any kind of windfall tax or any sign of the United Kingdom doing anything at all to help the people pay their energy bills, which of course are now being charged at an extortionate global rate, despite the fact that we are awash with renewable energy. There have been arguments from Ed Miliband today on the radio saying that Labour um, would stop 
basically new oil production. Uh, the idea being to concentrate on offshore wind, relax the stupid rules on onshore wind development and convert the English economy in the same way that Scotland has done to almost entirely renewable energy. Now, Scotland is already self-sufficient in renewable energy and is supplying approximately 25% of the rest of the United Kingdom's needs. So the trouble with this is, of course, that although we're supplying this 25% of the renewable electricity which England needs, they're not paying us anything for it. Scotland makes no money out of it. It's basically just supplied on tap whenever it's required through the so-called national grid. And I say so-called because it's an English national grid which charges people of Scotland more money to transmit their clean electricity to England than it does for people in the south of England generating green electricity to supply, say, to London. So it's a heavily skewed market. So what we are looking at at the moment is the Labour Party now claiming the moral high ground in England, saying that they're going to stop the investment in um, more oil and gas production in the North Sea, because, as Ed Miliband says, that with the best will in the world, it takes between 20 and 28 years for new oil fields to actually come on stream. And because these oil fields are so deep in the, the crust of the earth and so far offshore and in such deep water, actually costs more money to take the oil out, then they'll probably make from selling this stuff. Unless, of course, they sell it on the open market for a jacked up price, which is, of course, what they will do. So anyway, back to the point. Our human rights are about to be destroyed by the new um, British Bill of Rights. However, there is one good thing on the horizon, and that is an interesting little um, legal loophole as far as Scotland is concerned, and that is that the claim of right, which you've heard me talking about many, many times in the past, the claim of right still exists, and the claim of right is what guarantees all the Scots people their sovereignty and their right to leave the Union by popular majority if they so wish, and that cannot be affected by any change to the existing European Human Rights Act in the United Kingdom, simply because it predates the Union. That means that the law in Scotland concerning our rights to our sovereignty and our rights to vote on any national issue we like are guaranteed as a precondition of the Union Treaty itself. And this is something that the British state hates to admit, that they basically buggered this up because they didn't realise, I'm sort of talking about the English at the time in 1707, didn't realise that this precondition that the Scots negotiators had inserted was going to cause them problems 316 years later. But that is the fact. We have a basic human right to our own sovereignty, our own popular sovereignty, and that gives us rights over who rules us, whether we have a monarchy, we are capable as human beings of voting to remove any government that we so choose and replacing it with something that we do like. And I'm not talking about parties here, I'm talking about the entire system of government can be removed by a single uh, referendum of the people, a single vote of any kind. Now, we know that we're having a plebiscite within the next general election. And as I mentioned the other day, the bookies are offering very favourable odds at the moment for a general election actually before 2024. Uh, it seems that the bookies are of the opinion that the Tory government is not long for this world. And if the Labour Party's latest uh, announcements on what it plans to do in the North Sea are anything to go by, it's anybody's guess. But I suspect that uh, Sir Keir Starmer and his... Um, his pink, pinky, purpley, bluey, kind of coloured Labour Party may actually do it. But that doesn't affect Scotland in any way, because Scotland is not going to vote for Keir Starmer, because it would just be more of the same. However, we always have the right to leave the Union, and all we have to do is exercise that right in any democratic event which is recognised internationally, and a general election is just that. So we hope to hear some more about this from the SNP after the conference on the 19th of March. In the meantime, another piece of news came across my, my desk, as it were, this morning, and that is from uh, one of the Portsmouth newspapers. Now, this is where the British naval fleet is usually based, and it was pointing out the fact that the Duke of Edinburgh, the sister ship to the Queen Elizabeth aircraft carrier, is still in dock and is still suffering from multiple faults that are preventing it from being commissioned and being used by the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defence to project UK power abroad with its tiny fleet of incredible expensive American aeroplanes. 
So the British state has a problem with its defence procurement. It doesn't seem to be capable these days of designing and building a warship which actually works. Um, we witnessed the, um, the very embarrassing gaff, I think you could say, when the United Kingdom's destroyers were built with engines which only worked in cold water. And of course, where are your ships going to go? They might be going down to the Mediterranean. And when the water was a bit warmer, those ships' engines overheated immediately and they had to return to port. Now this kind of cock-up seems to be characteristic of the UK's Ministry of Defence and its manufacturers in BAE systems. This is something which I think they need to do something about. But it just goes to show you that as Scotland is supposedly protected by the Royal Navy and supposedly protected under the nuclear shield provided by the Royal Navy's fleet of nuclear submarines, I don't feel terribly safe in the hands of the British Ministry of Defence at the moment, especially when they can't even build a ship which functions. Why should we trust them uh, to have a system of nuclear-powered submarines capable of firing missiles from some point in the middle of the Atlantic when they can't even build a ship that works? So I'm not particularly confident that we are being protected properly from the potential threat of, let's say, a Russian incursion into our our seas, for example. We've witnessed the destruction of the Ukrainians' um, electricity infrastructure by simple missile attacks from the Russians. These are conventional missiles targeted at energy generation and, um, and transformer stations across the Ukraine. Wouldn't be that hard for the Russians to use their cruise missiles to attack, for example, our oil installations or our offshore wind installations and cripple our economy in a similar way. And yet we see nothing coming from the UK Ministry of Defence which is aimed at protecting these vital offshore interests. If we're going to have offshore wind, offshore tide uh, and any other, in fact, offshore installations of any sort whatsoever, they need to be protected. And right at the moment, aircraft carriers are not the way to do that. An aircraft carrier is basically a huge missile magnet. It's a massive target, easy to detect on radar. And despite the fact that it has these incredibly modern new F-35 uh, fighters from the United States, that doesn't really protect it very much from incoming missile threats. And despite the fact that they have missile systems on board these ships, well, would you trust them given what's already been happening with the aircraft carriers? So I guess my point is that Scotland is not a safe place at the moment um, because it's remaining in the United Kingdom. Its human rights are at risk, but we do have the right still to vote to end the union, and that's something we must remember when it comes to the de facto referendum within the general election. And we need to exercise that right and actually accept the fact that we have it. Many people are still unaware that the claim of right is a legal human right for all Scots, which gives you the sovereignty to get rid of whatever political system is being used to keep Scotland in place, and also allows us, if you wish, to get rid of the king, and also allows us to make international trade agreements as well. And remember that I think it was Angus Robertson was saying recently that a vote for independence should be linked to returning to full membership of the European Union. Now, many people have said, and I think rightly, this is a stupid idea because many of the people who want independence are not necessarily in favour of rejoining the Union per se. They may well be in favour of joining the European Free Trade Association, but certainly not the European Union. And I think the SNP's uh, strategists are currently still living in a bit of a bubble where they think that everybody in the whole of Scotland wants to fully rejoin the European Union and there are people who do but there are also people who don't and they still want independence and if you alienate that lot then the chances of winning this de facto referendum go down so I think it's very important that we keep those two things separate remember joining the European Union is normally done when an entire nation is uh, asked to vote on it in a referendum remember that the Republic of Ireland had three referenda before they joined the European Union in order to make sure that the people were happy with what the settlement was, it had to be adjusted several times before they voted yes. Which goes to show you just how much power you have when you are allowed to have a referendum on something. Anyway, that's it from me today, but just bear in mind that you are sovereign. You have the right to vote to end the union, and nobody can take that away with any English Bill of Rights. And 
let's face it, we're not safe within the UK. The Ministry of Defence has dropped the ball so many times, it's virtually lying on the ground the whole time. So that's it from me today. I'll see you again, I hope, tomorrow. In the meantime, keep the faith. And remember, you have the sovereignty to vote to end the union. And don't let anybody tell you different. I'll see you soon. Bye for now.